So good morning, you all. Be, uh, I want to welcome all the, the public and particularly Diana Paris, uh, who is going to be our keynote speaker uh, this morning. Uh, Diana Perez uh, is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires, a researcher at CONICET, which is the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas y Técnicas. I think it's uh, the Argentine version of our CNPq. And uh, she's also a member. And I think, uh, are you the president now of SADAF, Sociedad Argentina, the Analysis Philosophica? You work, I, right? Uh, I work. Now I am the director of the research institute, which is in Sadaf and Conicet. Is, uh, oh. So actually, she's she's growing bigger in the institution. <laughs> she's now the president of the whole institute. Uh, and I mean, uh, we. Uh, I think that's the fourth time that you participate in this colloquium. Uh, uh, I think maybe we about. Uh, time to give her a break, right? Because she's coming here in a row. I remember I invited her to uh, come and that was in person, right? Before in 2017 to Saint-Jean del Rey when I and some colleagues organized the last edition of this event. And that was an amazing days and a uh, very nice uh, presentation and stay, Diana Perez at that time. The, the year uh, after that in 2018, I went to Argentina and I met her group in Buenos Aires. And I must say, it's a, it's a vibrant, uh, a really kind of a, uh, uh, an amazing group uh, of mostly female philosophers, which is uh, not common in this area, with the exception of the people in UNESP here in Brazil. So, uh, but that, they have the same thing in Buenos Aires, Mario Odessi. It's a, a bunch of very good uh, philosophers. It's a very interesting group. Uh, and it's a, an immense pleasure to have you back, Diana Perez. I'm just going to say a few things. She published a lot. And more recently, I think, uh, she has published, maybe, and that's my, I don't know, uh, seems to me that she, she has published the two most important books on the second person in recent years. Uh, one in English, with a, which she published with uh, Gomila, who is going to be the keynote speaker. Uh, uh, tomorrow uh, night. Uh, I think that's going to be the last session of this event. And the book is Social Cognition uh, and the Second Person in Human Interaction, published this year, 2021, by Rutledge. Uh, and she published before 2018, which is the most important book in Latin America, for sure, about this topic she organized. Uh, with Diego Lawler, this book, uh, La, Seconda, uh, La Segunda Persona y Las Emociones, The Second Person's Emotions. Uh, and before that, she published other books like uh, Sentir, Desear, Creer, Una Aproximación de los Conceptos Psicológicos. I mean, my, my, my Spanish is really <laughs> a portuñol, actually, but uh, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> sense, uh, desire, belief, uh, an approximation to the psychological concepts. That was in 2013. Uh, in other books, for instance, uh, uh, another one she organized in 2010, uh, Conceptos, Debates Contemporaneos in Filosofía y Psicología. Uh, how is my Spanish, by the way? Uh, I think. Better than my Portuguese. <laughs> well, that's something. Uh, I remember in, in uh, Buenos Aires uh, going uh, to a, a bar with uh, Diana and her friends. And after one or two beers, I just couldn't understand a word. <laughs> I decided to go English, which is horrible. I mean, I was in Buenos Aires talking English, but that's it. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I want to thank you again very much. Uh, and the word is yours, Diana. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I, I don't remember how many times I went still to this este, colloquium, colloquia, but este, you can still invite me many more times because I, I really enjoy being with you guys. You're also a terrific group and I learn a lot also this time by video conference, but going to Brazil and talking to you and spending the time there. That's something that I miss, this pandemic. <laughs> okay, so 
Uh, I will share my presentation. Now. <laughs> ah, okay. So, the, the idea is to talk about uh, the second person and the arts. Uh, and my, my idea is to try to see what these ideas that we developed with Tony Gomila in this book, the, the book uh, published this year about the second person, uh, can shed some light on our relationship with art. Um, so the idea is that our the, the idea that our understanding and engagement with art should be studied in connection with our understanding and engagement with human minds is an old one, at least since the, since the introduction of the notion of empathy in aesthetics. So in this talk, I have in my uh, I will uh, try to uh, uh, explore action, but replacing empathy by the second person for some reasons that I will present briefly. So uh, when I, I and another uh, uh, remark that I want to make in the beginning is that I'm not thinking only about the fine arts or the works of art and related art, art, art activities, art related activities uh, within the canonical tradition, but occidental tradition, but about many objects and activities uh, which are not the canonical examples that we think when we think about art like cave paintings on children's uh, drawings on tribal songs or rock recitals on comics or whatever so the plan <clears throat> will be the following in the first uh, part I will present empathy and simulation, which are the, the, the background notions that are in, in general in the discussions in the philosophy of art about these topics. Second, I will present some problems and limitations that I think both theory shares. Um, in the third part, I will present the second person perspective. I will just say two or three very sketchy ideas that uh, are in the book that I mentioned before. and. Uh, the last part will be the application of some ideas to the 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 art, the case of art, the arts. So, <clears throat> the background. The notion of empathy and that of sympathy emerged in the 18th century with David Hume and Adam Smith, which are there, and it had two theoretical roles. In the first place, it had the function of accounting for a special psychological bond that exist between human beings and allow us to have an access to other people's mind. In the second place, it was related to our moral response to other human beings, but I will let aside this, this moral uh, side of the question. In the 19th century, Theodore Leaves, the other figure in the, in the picture, in the, the screen, adopted the notion of empathy or what he called sentimental projection as a key notion in his explanation of aesthetic experience. Another, another um, remark that I want to make is that I am talking about um, involvement or engagement with art and understanding in, in the context of uh, consuming art. And I, probably I will use the expression aesthetic experience as a synonymous of that idea, but I'm not trying to, to compromise with all the features that aesthetic experience have in the mainstream tradition. Uh, so according to Lips, we can access to other people's minds empathically, which means immediately, imitatively, or I, I am uh, based on their experience expressive corporality, projecting my own feelings onto the other. And the same psychological mechanism is at the base of aesthetic experience. The expressiveness of the art work art of art triggers the imitative mechanisms that led us to project our own feeling onto the work. So empathy is this process of imitation or internal resonance that led us to imitate movements and expressions we perceive in other human beings to experience the feelings that uh, 
of the other as our own and or to project our feelings uh, on the other. In the case of art, it involves the idea that works of art provoke or give reasons to, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, or give rise to the same um, responses uh, in us as those produ produced by the movement and expressions of the body of other human beings and or that we project our subjective feelings in the work of art. So <clears throat> in the last um, 40 years, empathy was displaced in the debate about the ways in which we understand other people's mind. And as probably you all know, two theories, two opposite theories emerged in the 80s, the theory theory and the simulation theory. We have here Alvin Goldman, Gregory Curry, and Vittorio Alesse. Uh, all of them adopted the simulation theory um, in order to explain how we understand other people's mind in the case of, Gale of uh, Goldman and also Galese with the mirror ne neurons. And Curry and also Galese try to use this idea of simulation in order to uh, understand and uh, explain our aesthetic experience. So the simulation theory <clears throat> takes the first person as a starting point and make projections from this point of view to the person whose behavior is to be understood. The subject then projects herself in the place of the other, in some versions, the physical space, in others, the psychological situation. And being there, the person should imagine how she would have act, and then the imagined mental state and actions are attributed to the other person. In the philosophy of art, the idea of simulation was adapted and applied to art. There are two reasons why simulation theory gained traction within this field. In the first place, the simulation theory allows us to explain an, our understanding of minds in terms of projection of my mind toward the others, as empathy does. As in the case of empathy, the same mental state is projected from the first person to the other. In this sense, the simulation theory somehow, somehow put new clothes on an old notion of empathy. Second, the simulation theory highlights the role of imagination as a psychological faculty underlying the simulation problem, uh, process. And many theories of art also uh, put imagination as a central psychological fa faculty involved in aesthetic judgment. And according to some philosophies, philosophers of art, such as Gregory Curry that I mentioned before, simulation is the mechanism which is at play in, or in the understanding of all, all forms of art, in art in general. <clears throat> it is important to remark that this simulation process seems to have found empirical an, an empirical um, basis on the mirror neural system, as I said before, and for the last 10 years, Galese also dedicated himself to study how our mirror neural system is at work in the process of perception of works of art in our aesthetic experience through a mechanism that he labeled embodied simulation. So in this work, I will leave aside uh, the, the, the role of imagination, but I want to focus on two um, problems or limitations that both uh, empathy and the simulation theory share and I think that the second person can overcome. <clears throat> so the problems or the limitations I see <clears throat> are the following. In the first place, uh, both theories um, take the first person as a starting point. <clears throat> In some popular versions the, of empathy and the simulation theory, this first step in the simulation or empathic process implies the presence of phenomenal concepts or what, what are also called first person concepts, which are involved in the beliefs about our own experience. And the second step allows us to project them on top the other, in the case of the simulation theory, something that Goldman says, or to the work of art, which is something that Kendall Walton says, for example. 
in my opinion, the strategy of phenomenal concepts is wrong-headed, so I, I will skip the, the, the reasons now. I, I published a couple of papers about that. Uh, but uh, if you reject, as I do, phenomenal concepts, <clears throat> so if introspection, the first step, does not make use of the phenomenal concepts, then before start the simulation or empathic process, is it, it is necessary to possess, possess a set of psychological concepts that can be applied both to the first and the third person. Therefore, a mechanism that, mechanism that start from the first person cannot be thought of as the most basic. The second person perspective, on the contrary, assumes that it is in second person interaction, in IU interactions, that the first psychological attributions occur and that it is within these interactions that psychological concepts are acquired. And this is the reason why psychological concepts involve the ability to apply it to the self and to the other. They are not just first person concepts. <clears throat> However, the Central and most important problem that I see in using ideas such as simulation or empathy, both to account for our understanding of other's mind and uh, for our understanding and involvement with art, is that it does not seem reasonably to hold that, the, I, that an identity of experiences is necessary in order to understand, appreciate and enjoy works of art, nor to understand the minds of our fellow human beings. Indeed, many times we achieve successful understanding of other people's mind without entertaining the same thoughts, feelings, or emotions than the other. Thus, the second person perspective on mental attribution has a broader spectrum of possibilities than the simulation or empathy theory, since it accepts as a particular case that of the sameness of the mental state between me and the other person or between me and the work of art. But according to the second person perspective, the usual situation does not imply identity or sameness of psychological state. <clears throat> so I will present now the second person perspective. Uh, in this picture, uh, some of the people who helped me think about that, uh, Tony, Gomila and me, last, the last time we saw face to face, while writing the book in, in Puerto Pochenza, Mallorca. The second picture is um, Silvia Español, my friend. Uh, she's a development and psychology. That picture was taken in, in La Rioja, Argentina. And all I know about ontogenesis is uh, due to Silvia, but the mistakes are mine. And the last picture is Carolina Scotto, maybe you know her. She's a Wittgensteinian, my Wittgensteinian inspir inspiration uh, from the University of Córdoba in Argentina. And both Carolina and Tony uh, published their papers on the second person in 2001 or 2002. The, the first time I, I, I read about this, this idea was, was reading Tony and, and Carol. <clears throat> so, the second person perspective is a theoretical proposal within the field of social cognition that assumes the post-cognitivist vision of the mind. The starting point of this uh, proposal are second person interactions, those situations in which two human beings meet face to face or body to body and perceive each other as human beings that act intentionally, get emotional, have feelings and also understand each other as such. Its central thesis is that this type of interaction is mediated by a characteristic type of psychological attributions that we call second person attributions. They are automatic, practical, implicit, transparent, reciprocally contingent, and dynamic. And the second person perspective also holds that these type of attributions are the most basic phylogenetically, ontogenetically, and conceptually. But this second person perspective does not deny that there are other perspectives of psychological attribution beyond the second person ones. We can call them, if you want, first and third person perspectives. 
And in my view, the three perspectives are necessary to fully explain the complex ways of mutual understanding that human beings display, both when we are in second person interactions, as well as when we are alone or we are simply non-participant observers of other people's actions. Here we can see uh, some examples of what we call second person interactions. And as you can see, there are very different situations. Some of them are competitive, others are cooperative. Some of them are loving situations, while others are situations where there is a confrontation. Some of them have explicit rules, such as the football game. Some others do not. Some of them have a clear purpose, for, for example, to score. Some of them, such as dancing in a milonga, have no clear purpose. They are just interactions that are enjoyable. But, of course, adult baby interactions constitute the paradigmatic type of second person interactions because in these interactions we can see ways of involvement and mutual understanding that do not depend on the possession of a public language, nor do they imply performing complex attributions of mental state with propositional content. On the contrary, in these cases, mental attributions are made directly perceiving the expressive body, facial expressions, the expression of the voice, etc. In these intersubjective encounters, typically, we express our feelings, pleasure, disgust, joy, and we react both to the way the other addresses us and to how objects of the, and events in the shared world affect us. This direct understanding of the other produces an immediate, non-reflective, automatic, affective and intentional response. Emotions and affective states in general are the entrance door and what keep alive the interactions and they become constitutive of our mutual understanding. <clears throat> However, there is much more at stake in our interactions with others than these second person attributions and these communicative exchanges. The acquisition of cultural norms, the standard rules of the society in which we live, shape in complex way human interactions, and the acquisition of a public language allow us to attribute more complex mental states with propositional content, and to understand the intentions and actions of others and our own with more precision. It is in early second person interaction that arises the opportunity for the acquisition of many of the cognitive abilities that we display throughout our life. We acquire the psychological concepts that allow us to understand human minds. We acquire our mother tongue. We acquire all the social guidelines that regulate our actions and allow us as we grow to carry out tasks as varied as reading, cooking, dancing, participating in swimming competitions, riding a bike, singing, playing instrument, and getting involved in various artistic, artistic practices of our culture. Once we have acquired, in the context of second person interactions, the various skills that allow us to participate in different social practices, we can use them, these skills, beyond the context of interaction. We can self-attribute mental states, cook or sing alone. We can make psychological attributions to individuals with whom we are not interacting, past or future individuals, fictional individuals, some individuals uh, uh, away from us in space, etc. <clears throat> but as much as through our life we may acquire an enormous amount of new cognitive abilities, the initial way of understanding others in interaction is always present. Indeed, adult forms of interaction still involve second person attributions interwoven with a set of social rules that make more complex forms of interaction possible. We can think of the variety of abilities at play when we are in a face-to-face -face dialogue or when two musicians play a piece together or when we dance a milonga with our partner. But also, once the relevant cognitive skills are acquired, we can move away from the participatory attitude, step back and evaluate from the outside people's actions. Sometimes we adopt a more universal point of view that distances us from the concrete individual in front of us, and we wonder about the correctness of their actions. Sometimes we adopt the attitude of the critic, 
trying to evaluate the actions of the other, in particular acti artistic activities such as dancing and singing. It is worth noticing that in our early encounter with others, in our early childhood, we participate in an immense, uh, we are, um, uh, we participate in the patterns that underlie the artistic practices of our culture in which we are in May, immersed. So there are plenty of studies in development and psychology that connect some forms of adult baby interactions with various forms of art. Uh, for example, Trevarden uh, developed the idea of communicative musicality uh, in order to describe early interactions, uh, highlighting some musical features of this interaction, such as the medica, melodic contour, the rhythm, etc. Uh, also, the features that can be observed in, in, in for example, baby sucking rhythm, in the exchange of terms in proto conversation, the characteristics of the speech directed at the baby, the baby talk or mother s. There are also performances directed at baby that have been studied both from music and dance and uh, Silvia Fagnola and Chabela Martinez uh, with other people here in, in Argentina studied these kind of, of um, situations and the characteristic of this um, performance directed at people, at, at babies. <clears throat> So there are many things that we adults do when interacting with baby that are already shaped by the specific art forms of our culture. So in summary, the access to the other's mind in ecological conditions occur in a direct perceptual way. It depends on the expressive patterns displayed by the individual that allow us to access to their mental states but they are not necessarily the same than those of the other person. Emotional engagement and emotional reactions expressed in the movement of our body are the key for the interaction to flow smoothly. The expressive patterns present in these interactions can be analyzed according to their aesthetic qualities, which are already present in second person interaction in early childhood. So let me now <clears throat> present my very, very sketchy ideas about <clears throat> um, the relation that we could establish between the second person and art. Some ideas were already um, uh, studied. For example, Tony <clears throat> Gomila has a couple of papers about the second person and theater, the second person and music. Chabela Martinez uh, with her group, that's this last year published a, a series of paper, a dossier about the second person and musical performance with different uh, genres uh, like jazz or classical orchestra, tango, etc. But I want now to give something that I hope <clears throat> uh, will be a general argument in favor of the importance of taking into account the second person perspective in order to understand the aesthetic experience. Of course, it is not the only relevant element to account for aesthetic experience. On the contrary, I believe that the second person alone is not enough, just as it is not enough to account for the multiple and complex attributions of psychological states that we humans do. So, as explained above, empathy and simulation suppose the identity of mental states between the appreciators and the artwork. The second person perspective does not suppose such identity. On the contrary, it considers that the other individual in the interaction is an other, with a capital O, whose mental states are direct, directly perceived and reacted to without being identical with mine. On the contrary, in general, they are different. The same, I argue, is true of works of art. And the reason is quite simple. In the case of works of art, there is never a single mind to understand and engage with. On the contrary, one of the interesting things in the case of art is that there is a plurality of others with whom we interact. <clears throat> of course, there are a great variations when it comes to the others involved depending on the art form 
that we are talking about. In what follows, I will mention several relevant second person interactions in the case of R, and I will give some examples. I'm not trying to support the idea that all these forms of interaction are present in all forms of R. I will limit myself to, li to listing various types of possible interactions, and then we have to see what happens in each form of R. So, <clears throat> in the first place, the appraiser becomes involved and understands the characters of the play, if there are. For example, in a novel, in a play, in, in, in a painting, in a symphony, even the instruments can be characters. Indeed, it is constitutive, a constitutive part of our involvement with narrative works of art that we react and engage with the adventures and misadventures of the characters in the work. Not only do we need to understand what happens to them to be able to follow the plot of the play, but through the play we get emotionally involved with them. The characters matter to us. We want them to succeed or to fail, to fall in love, etc. The second person perspective can account in a simple way for this type of involvement since, as I said in the previous section, it is uh, it, uh, it can account not only for the relationship we have with other another person with whom we really interact, but also allow us to explain how we transcend the here and now to attribute mental states and engage with past, past or fictional characters. The second person perspective highlights a central role of our affective involvement as the basic, uh, the basis of social cognition. <clears throat> second, the appraiser, the appraiser is in a relation to the performer or performers, with the actor as different from the character, with the musician who performs the work in front of us, who may be not the composer of the piece, etc. It is important to mention that the relationship in some art form is very distant. Canonical forms of art consumption in Western culture usually involve situations in which the audience is very passive, such as a theater or a concert hall. However, there are, uh, of course, the, the cinema is extreme version where we cannot interact with the actors. However, there are much more interactive forms of art participatory theater, a rock concert, a stand-up. In many art forms, the artist interact with the appreciator and makes him part of the play. The second person perspective focus on this type of dynamic and mutual interactions. <clears throat> Third, there are other people involved in works of art to which we have much less uh, direct or more inferential or hypothetical access, for example, the narrator in a narrative work that may or may not be the author or a character, the point of view implicit in a work, in a painting, for example, the po point of view uh, from which the painting is seen, the persona in the music, if, if there is something like that, or the implicated author in a novel, etc. It is an element that the audience, audience construct when contemplating the work, and in that sense, it is not an authentic order because it is not independent of the appreciator. However, it is an additional person at stake when it comes to understand the work of art, which sometimes express the point of view of this hypothetical being independently of the flesh and blood artists who create the work or the characters that include or the artists who give life to the work. <clears throat> For the flesh and blood human creator of the work, um, so every work of art is a human creation and every work of art involves an intentionally intentionality or agency that made the existence of that option possible in the first place. In Western culture, artistic authorship is central. That is why we speak of, uh, of Miró's or Beethoven's distinctive style. But this does not happen in all cultures. In some cases, it's irrelevant who the artist is, as in the case of religious art in the Middle Ages, uh, the intentionality is relevant, not the identity of the author. It, and the same is true in, for example, Melanesian art or many other kind of forms of art. 
Thus, the author is not always present, but is always implicit. A work of art is something that a human did, or a, a group of humans, um, and that, or at least a human put in the place or instituted as a work of art. <clears throat> Uh, many times the knowledge that we have of the identity of, and personal history of the author is at stake in our understanding and involved with, involvement with the work. In other, it is not the identity or the history of the author, but his concrete material action that led to the creation of the work that is important to art. As Hel said, sometimes the admiration of the work of art produces in us is based on the fact that we are amazed by the mastery of the author's agency by doing something that we cannot do. For example, with a musical instrument, with, a, with the voice, with the hands when drawing or painting, etc., or the body when dancing. Likewise, there are aspects of the materiality of the work that are traces of the presence of a human act. For, a, for example, the brush stroke or, or the line in a drawing. And when we perceive the line, we capture the quality of the body movement that generates that uh, trace. Galese, in, in some articles, show that in these cases, in addition to the visual cortex, the mirror neural system is activated and interprets this fact as an embodied simulation of the artist's action on the canvas. Regardless of whether it is necessary to read the activation um, uh, of the mirror neural system in this way, the point is that the vision of the product of a human action refers to the human action that gave its existence and therefore embodies the ancient intentions and emotions. These material traces of human agency are precisely the expressive features that activate our psychological attributions in the context of second person interaction with our with other human beings. In the fifth place, the work itself, the material object or event, can be thought of as a second person. At least some people think that. After all, empathy thought to attribute or project feelings onto the work, the painting, or the, the sound, the music. And the anthropologist Gale considers that the object itself has its own agency independent of the human agency that gave rise to its existence. For me, is a question still open uh, is to what extent the work itself has a second person interaction with the appraiser that is different from the ones that uh, they have with each of the other people involved mentioned in the previous point. There seems to be a consensus of the idea that there are forms of interaction with the work that somehow resemble the ways in which we human interact with each other by endowing the work with affectivity and agency. See, in the sixth place, the, uh, to fully account for our understanding and involvement with a work of art, we should consider the second person relationship that the appraisers have with each other. As I said before, there are very passive forms of art, uh, art reception, but there are also others much more active in which the interaction between the spectators are essential for the constitution of our aesthetic experience. Let us think, this is something that um, uh, Marie, Marina, me, Maria told me, uh, someone who is working with, with also with Chabela in that group, uh, let us think of an electronic party or a film club in which the quality of the experience relative to the film under consideration varies depending on the comments and discussion of the various aspects of the world provoked in the group of spectators who share their ideas and impressions. Unless we are alone, such as when we read a book or watch a stream, uh, movie in, in our computer by streaming, uh, the others close to us who startle or smile with us, even in a classical theater, collaborate in the constitution of our aesthetic experience. Many second person phenomena, such as emotional contagion, are part 
of our experience with others before our confine. So, um, let us, let me uh, sum up and finish the presentation. We are interacting with a multiplicity of others while appreciating a work of art. Of course, not all the interactions I men mentioned so far are present while appreciating every single work of art, but in general, there is more than one of them as taking our appreciation of the work. The different interaction with character, performers, artists, etc., overlap in our experience with the work. Thus, there is a plurality of real or fictitious agents directly perceivable or inferred from various aspects of the world with whom we interact simultaneously or successively when appreciating a work of art. It is important to highlight that the understanding and involvement with the different others who are responsible, responsible for our experience before the work are not enough to understand the aesthetic experience, just as second person attribution alone are not enough to account for human psychological attribution. It is necessary to incorporate, uh, incorporate other elements that have nothing to do with a second person perspective to fully understand our experience with work of art. The second person perspective provides us with tools to think about aspects of our interaction with these various people involved in the works, as well as to understand at least some aspects of our emotional response, which are part of this aesthetic experience. Aesthetic experience arises from these multiple second level interactions of the character with each other, the appreciator with the character, with the situation, the narrator, etc., plus an enormous amount of other relevant elements, for example, the subject past experience, the information she possessed from the world in general, from the particular art form, from the artistic period, from the author, her cultural background, her perceptual abilities her linguistic abilities to understand literary works, etc. Not all these cognitive abilities are present in the constitution of our experience before all works of art. Our works are very diverse. Some works of art are material objects, other sound events, some involve vision and hearing, some involve moving bodies, some do not. Some involve our ability to understand narratives and involve knowing certain symbolism characteristic of some culture or tradition, know the historical movement in which they were created or <clears throat> to which they refer, etc. Likewise, the cognitive abilities, the prior information, the previous experiences of the appraisal, the values and beliefs that they possess are also elements that will be put together into play in each of the individual experiences that in the different moments of our lives we have with the various works of art. We never pass twice in the same river. We do not have twice the same aesthetic experience before the same work. We never repeat exactly the same patterns of interaction with others. Each particular relationship with the work involves some of the elements mentioned and not others, or a greater or lesser development of them. And therefore, uh, there is a lot of different ways to understand and to be engaged with forms of art. Well, many thanks for your being with me. I will stop sharing in order to see you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, so uh, now we're going to start the Q&A session. Uh, let me see. OK, first, Felipe, please. Uh, hi, hello, uh, uh, Diana. Thank you for this great presentation. It was very, very nice. I really enjoyed it. And I have some questions about our engagements with uh, works of fiction, with books. So at some point you said that in these cases that we, we have a second, our second person interaction with the, the author or the narrator would be like inferential. So just want to explore uh, this a bit and to, to get a sense of what you mean by that. Because it seems to me that there's, in, in a sense, like the way we engage with uh, books is not so different from the way we engage with someone in a campfire telling stories, you know, because we react not only to what is happening in the story, but also in the way the person tells the story. So the person's like, and you don't know what happens, you know what happens next? Then we get this reaction you know, as the person is telling the story. 
and the same thing happens in books. You know, we, we're not just having a, an interaction, a perspective in relation to the characters and what's happening to them, but he also reacts to this sort of like li literary and narrative techniques of the author. You know, and then we, we, we like he said the way the author might build up the suspense, and then we get to the end of the chapter. Oof, that's finished, thank God. And then we move on to the next chapter. So in a sense, I wonder if our, our second person perspective interaction with the narrator, with the author, could it also be uh, more direct and practical rather than inferential and is manifested in the way we react to these literary uh, techniques. So what do you think about that? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so... I, I I wanted to distinguish two cases: the case of the flesh and blood author, uh, and the case of the narrator, which might or might not be the author, and might or might not be some of the one of the characters of the play or the novel. Uh, in the case of cinema, you can have a, a, a voice enough, which is uh, the case of cinema is is more complicated because you never know who the author is it's not one person you have the director the the, the script the one who wrote the write the script and so there are many many different uh, that's a that's a problem for cinema in, in a novel it's easier um, but the author is not there it is might not be not might not be the narrator so that's that's a first point so when when i talk to about the author um what i think is that there are uh, we can have a different appreciation of a work knowing some facts about the history or the life or the intentions of the flesh and blood author that is something that that not does not happen with a narrator which is not a real flesh and blood person but somehow a constructed person by the author and by us while reading uh, in order to present us the story in a certain way which might be a point of view different from the author from the characters etc uh, so th that uh, last uh, narrator the, the the one that is constructed by the author and by us when reading is the one that I think is highly inferential in the sense that uh, we are sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to see and, and the narrator is the one who's telling the story in the, in, the, in the room in front of me but sometimes you never know exactly who is talking, why he or she is saying what she says, it, from what point of view is talking, if he knows everything you should know, if you are trying to cheat the, the reader. And, uh, so, of course, it's something that also is important for us uh, while reading and engaging with uh, the novel or the, the film. But I think that there is much more cognitive work to do in order to understand that <laughs> particular point of view. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. I think I was kind of mixing up like the author and narrator, and narrator in my question, but now it, it, it's clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, Pedro uh, de la Bella, please. Okay. Yeah, great presentation. I mean, you, you, you have made my work a lot easier because I'm, I'm coming next. And I'll be talking a lot about literature, so you've prepared the terrain, the terrain somehow. But um, I was going to ask you about one, one possibility coming from your presentation, which goes a long way towards explaining the evolution of the arts. So from what uh, Michael Tomazel would call a joint intentionality as people uh, join together in chanting and dancing, uh, perhaps in ritual, uh, and this uh, uh, and all kinds of uh, crafts, you know, that involve uh, artificial patterns produced uh, for uh, by the collectivity for the joint appreciation of that collectivity itself. So, I mean, it goes a long way towards explaining the evolution, uh, uh, evolutionary aspects of the arts. At a certain point in your presentation, but I, I just couldn't help thinking about uh, our uh, Western canon. You said you wouldn't be having 
the canon in mind, and that's that's great. But I couldn't help thinking about this kind of uh, this kinds of aesthetic experiences, like the ones you know envisaged by people like Pete Mondrian or Malevich, in which there's no sense of empathy involved. You are just standing before an object which is totally abstract, uh, and. I mean, I think that your narrative, the way you place the problem, goes a long way towards, uh, ex I mean, uh, eliciting the issues regarding the history of art. Because at a certain point, in order to establish a dialogical perspective in our relationship with the arts, and I totally agree with you, it's always there to some extent, you need an idea of authorship. You need culturally formed ideas of uh, what an author is, what aesthetic uh, artistic intentions can be, and they seem to have changed a lot mm -hmm. as we reach modernity. There seems to be a, a, a very big differences in what we expect, for instance, uh, from an our uh, narrator uh, uh, around the campfire, or even from a medieval narrator, which would pick, for example, uh, King Arthur's stories and simply retell them. Uh, between that and Cervantes, we have a big difference. In Cervantes, we have an author created his own fictional world, his own character, and the whole set of expectations regarding this, this thing that we call art seems to have changed. And yes, we have a dialogue, uh, a dialogical perspective, but very mediated by the figure of the author, which is a historical construct. So uh, now, I mean, this is not a question. I, I would like you to uh, elaborate on this because I think that uh, the, your framework uh, sets the basis, the grounds for us to observe how historical, our historical involvement with the arts uh, took place in the West. And it seems to be very different within the West, but between the West and other parts of the world. Uh, so the question, if there is one, is for you to uh, deal with this. How how far does your model go towards uh, behaving as a, a descriptive model for us to understand difference between uh, Western, modern Western ways to deal with the arts and more, let's say, anthropological fundamental ways from which the arts have evolved? I mean, it's with you now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the for the question, and I, I would like to hear your talk later, but probably I cannot be here. I'm, I'm sorry. So I ask you, please, to send me, or or if it is uh, recorded and I can see later, I want to hear your. Uh, your by the by the way, the the talks are going to be available all of, all of them later on YouTube. So. Ah, great. So because I, I, I'm sorry, but I being at home, I will miss some of them and I will want to, to hear them all and maybe uh, start uh, in changing ideas by email or whatever uh, later. But um, in any case, uh, uh, when I presented the, the, the people that uh, helped me or with, with, with whom I interact in order to think about these things. I presented a, a developmental psychologist, but I don't have a friend <laughs> and a, a anthropologist or a, a cognitive archaeologist or something like that in order to um, can build by myself a story about the phylogenesis of uh, these different things. So I read probably many things about that, but um, it seems to me easier to talk about the, the ontogenesis of these things than about the evolution and the way in which things happen, I don't know, uh, a lot of years ago before <clears throat> we have written uh, things to, to look and um, I, I have some doubts about the way in which the prehistory is told us and what we can really know uh, because uh, about what happened then uh, in cognitive terms uh, due to the very, very poor uh, uh, 
traces that we have about what happened. So it's, it's, it's really highly um, speculative what could have happened <laughs> before and um, comparing with other cultures that still exist are, in my view, not an easy task. Uh, so um, uh, I, I'm not sure what to say about uh, the prehistory of <laughs> this cognitive stuff. I uh, do read some things about the ontogenesis, but it's easier there because the, the practices and the culture is around the baby. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to build um uh, the rules from nothing but uh, you start with something even with it, the culture in which babies are raised so um i have no doubts that we all human beings are raised in a culture which is highly artistic every culture in the sense that for example i didn't mention but there are many studies about lullabies and the sing singing performed to babies and uh, all that kind of, of stuff and um, in that sense uh, the what i try to explore is the connection that there is between uh, in, the, in the first uh, place between cognition and emotion and I think that that connection should also be uh, thought, including aesthetic qualities. So there are things that are more no, likable or, or make us happier or whatever, and uh, or we enjoy them more. And that is also a relevant um, feature in order to understand how our minds are built. So um, that is what I was trying to, to, to explore in general. So um, I don't know if that is it's descriptive or <laughs> in a sense, it, 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 it wants to be um, uh, acceptable for yeah, according to the empirical uh, evidence we have. Um, uh, but, but, of course, uh, many things are studied, but not all of them in the West, in, in cultures of the Western tradition, which has, as I said, an established idea about, about what art is and what kind of uh, artistic uh, uh, stimulus we offer to the babies and all that. For example, I, I choose very consciously what, where, what would be the first music that my first son hear while uh, he was born. So um, uh, the Four Seasons by Vivaldi, by the way. So uh, in a sense, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you were asking me a question, but my intention is to try to mix all these things together in order to understand better how we, how our, our, our minds are built. And I prefer because of the, the, the closeness of the people that, who are around me and because of the more um, precise uh, evidence that I have to think about the ontogenesis than the phylogenesis. Thank All right, uh, Ernesto now. Hi, Diana. Well, thank you for the talk. And I have two questions that are maybe connected. The first question is, how do you explain the fact that some people in the spectrum of autism seem to have a very developed sense of appreciation of art, or at least of performance? I don't know if they appreciate or not. I suppose they do, but at least they can play music or draw or, or things like that. The second question is, I think, maybe connected or maybe not, uh, that uh, we might think that, uh, at least as far as works of fictions, works of fiction are concerned, 
we are we decouple them from reality. There is a quarantine of those works, and we know that they don't belong to our the real world, just as in make believe games, as Walton says, you do have a different reality. But then when you are engaged in a make believe game with, with someone else, then there is a, clearly a certain person for you to, uh, to interact with during the play. But when you are reading a book or seeing a film, uh, you are simply the couple. And it might be very sophisticated to, to have a thought about the author. Maybe we can think that most of the times there is no there is nobody else to, with whom to to interact, and it seems to be a, precisely a sort of personal experience, <clears throat> like reading a book and you having them uh, separated from from you. And uh, I don't I don't I, I don't I don't know. If this is certainly not everybody's experience, but that may be the case. And I think it is in contrast with face-to-face -face interaction. It, and the fact that when you have face-to-face -face interaction, as you've shown in Stone, you cannot decouple, you cannot separate. You are reacting to someone to someone else in front of you, which is the basis of uh, second-person interactions, having someone else in face in, in, in front of you. And that's not the case of, of work of fiction. So we might think that at least in some cases, uh, the appreciation of work of art is not to have a second person in front of you, which is the case for maybe of uh, noticed. And it might be the case of written book without having further thoughts about the author, but just having say an expectator view of what's happening in front of you. Because you don't have the reactions, you just just absorbing uh, how the events unfold in front of you. I mean, yeah, I don't I, know if make. I, I, I'm not sure, and I quite understood the last the the, the last question. Uh, if the, you are, uh, I mean, we might think that reading a book or seeing a film, you are an spectator. Yes. And being an spectator is having a third person point of view <laughs> on. Okay, well, uh, I'm not sure about that, but I, I have two, two answers. Uh, one of them is the most um, deep, I think, which is that, uh, in my view at least, uh, in our book, for example, the, the idea is trying to explain how within this second person interaction, you can uh, acquire psychological concepts. And the key in order to understand the human world is to understand our minds and intentions and emotions and etc. And in a sense, the way in which these concepts are acquired involve many so to say, second person features that are built in the concepts. So every time you understand a story about human beings doing things, in a sense, you have the second person inside because the way in which you build the, 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 the possibility of understanding human interactions uh, in, 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 a, in the plot or whatever, in a novel, you have humans acting with each other and, I don't know, doing things to each other or loving them or uh, between each other or whatever. So that kind of uh, of narratives, which are all the narratives we have about how people interact between each other, uh, are in a sense a uh, root in our experience as second person interactors in the real world. So in that sense, the second person is always present there. Of course, you can take a, a more objective or distantiated point of view and see the things as being outside that relationship. But the relationship is something that you understand as something that you can also be engaged with or it happens to you or maybe you remember that you 
were in that situation before or whatever. So that that's the, the, the for me the, the the deeper reason. Uh, and I had another one that I forget. Ah no, and the other one is this. In some forms of art, not in not every form of art, but in some, for example, the in the case of a movie or a series or whatever, I think that it is not true that you are only an spectator. And the reason is this many times let's think about a movie when you have two characters who are talking and the camera uh, shows us the face of one of them who is talking to one, to to the other but is talking to the to the person who is viewing the film and then the person answers the camera switches and you are in the side of the other person in the interaction so in a sense the movie is putting you in the place of the interactor, not in the place of someone who watched the interaction from the outside. And pro probably in, the, in, in a written book is not that frequent, but in many other forms of art is very frequent that the, the tricks that the director or script or whatever does, um, tries to uh, involve you in a second person way in the fiction not just as an external spectator of what is going on and i think it's very frequent that that kind of situation. there are some books written in the second person george perec un, un homme qui dort and la modification michel butor written in the second person and there are others as well but i know it's two books so it, it's not that that, that uh, I, I don't I, I I remark many times that it is not that all that part. My I'm sorry, my connection is not good today. <laughs> um, so in, in the case of uh, autistic people, I I was saying um, the the I I'm not an expert, and probably. I uh, I understand that there are some um, differences. I prefer to call it them differences than deficiencies or whatever. <laughs> differences in the way some people uh, achieve the understanding of human interactions and are fluent in, in in human interactions in the way in which other people are. So. But also there are other differences in uh, the cognitive uh, capacities of all of us. We have different <laughs> degrees of ex uh, possibilities to, to, to make some things. And for example, many autistic, many, some more than in the general population, autistic children have a absolute here. I think that is, that's a way of saying in English, oido absoluto. Um, and also, uh, it seems that they they can see things in order to, um, for example, draw something that they are seeing uh, from a point of view which is closer closer to the way in which a painter see things than in a way that we people that are not trained in in drawings and paintings and all that. Uh, look at things around us. So we have a way to interact with the world that is obviously efficient for our survival, but the painter should see the world in another way, which is closer to the way in which some autistic children see the world. So maybe that explains why they are so good at making reproductions of things that we don't see usually because we are uh, just interacting with the world, not uh, looking at the tiny differences that can make a better drawing. So I, I think that there are many, um, as I said, my, my idea is that cognition, emotion and some sort of aesthetic <laughs> uh, capacities are together in the building or constitution of our cognition what we call cognition. Um, and so maybe the explanation of that uh, cases are because of some other uh, possibilities that some people is better at 
than we normal people. <laughs> All right, uh, Mariana. So uh, uh, it's very good to see you, Diana, and uh, thank you for your great uh, talk. Uh, my question is uh, the follow. Uh, uh, do you consider that it is possible for a, a non-human animals to interact aesthetically in the second person, uh, in the second person, uh, in the way you described? I refer, for example, to studies of evolutionary aesthetics and some examples examples of. Uh, uh, what they uh, what that could be uh, named as aesthetic ex experiences as in the case of bowerbirds that decorate uh, their nests uh, with uh, a, a variety of little things colored little things uh, that um, um, uh, can be uh, or, 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 or not appreciated by their possible partners. So uh, in this case, uh, will there be some kind of uh, psychological uh, uh, attribution uh, between uh, non-human animals? <laughs> That's it. Thank you, uh, Diana. Uh, thank you, Mariana. Nice to see you. Um, well, that kind of examples are the examples that make me doubt about the phylogenesis and the comparative studies between species because are exactly the kind of studies that take our notion of art or aesthetic experience, uh, build in this, as Pedro say, said, a history of the last, I don't know, uh, hundred, uh, so, uh, 2000 years or one or two and a half or three or whatever. Uh, 2000, of course, with the modern changes, but uh, we have an idea of what art is and what an aesthetic experience is, which is highly culturally, historically built. And many times that kind of notion is. Trans, not translated is uh, projected to the past and to other species, and and that is what uh, the, the the kind of 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 situations that made me doubt about the the idea of of um, of applying uh, these these notions there. So. Uh, so probably what the birds are doing is an art activity according to our conception of art, but I don't know what they think or if they think about anything like that. Uh, but I do think that some kind of second person interactions, which in the case of humans, um, allow us to acquire psychological concepts and to develop a second person attributions and understanding of each other's as we do, something that I say one more time is not only because of this second person interaction, but also because we acquire other abilities such as speaking language, for example, <laughs> uh, which has in principle another history different or from the second person interaction. So, but I do think that the kind of interactions, the second person interaction that are in the beginning of our lives, some of these kind of interaction that we still have in our adult are also possible between uh, anim non-human animals of some species, at least primates, I don't know birds, but maybe there are something like that because they have some kind of communicative exchange in a, in a, in a different sort of way than we do, but they, um, they understand each other in a sense uh, and can do things together, not like us, of course, and we can also interact in a second person with, uh, with an animal, for example, our pets or some other animals. So I think that there are 
the, that the, the kind of things that happens in a second person interaction are things that also happens in another species. But it doesn't mean that in that other species, the way in which these kind of interactions occur and the other cognitive abilities that species have allow them to do the, the, the pathway that we do, developing our uh, mind reading abilities or whatever you want to call them. I don't know if I answer your question. Oh, the, the, the path we do uh, or we follow is not necessary for second person interactions. Okay. No. No, that's no, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's no, no. It's it's highly contingent. It's highly contingent on our evolutionary history, but but also of our history, cultural history. Yeah, of course. My question presupposes a kind of conti evolutionary continuity, even in uh, some cultural aspects. So yeah, possibly you disagree with with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so thank you very much, Diana. Uh, all right. So we have another section at 11, but I want to add a comment myself, uh, Diana. Uh, it's about, uh, actually, it's, a, uh, it's inspired in the work of a student of mine who is finishing his master's uh, thesis, uh, João Cesar Ramos, who is in the room now. So I, I'm going to borrow your ideas, João. Uh, to uh, this question, which is the following. When you presented the simulation theory and criticized it, uh, I think, of, uh, look, I, I don't want to play the devil's advocate here. It's not that we can just kind of rebuild it. Uh, it can be rebuilt in a way that it's going to be satisfactory. But I think the criticism itself is somehow unfair because uh, the idea is not that you project the emotions uh, that you already have but maybe uh, you can uh, somehow uh, calibrate uh, the uh, whatever emotions you have in order to actually increase your emotional understanding. So actually, you can understand emotions that you didn't have before. And I'm going to give you an example. The, the thing is, uh, this uh, student of mine is uh, in his uh, this, in his thesis. He uh, argues that our, for instance, uh, phenomenal. Uh, uh, comprehension or whatever sort of phenomenal uh, experiences we have. Uh, let's take, for instance, Mary's case, you know, Jackson's uh, knowledge argument. Uh, but let's take not Mary, but another uh, character, let's say sad Mary, uh, which is a, a, a person who lives in this room and studies everything about the uh, feeling sad, but never actually uh, was sad. So she doesn't know how it feels, how, it, how it's like to be sad. So she knows everything that happens in the brain, whatever the neurophysiology of uh, feeling sad and all that. But uh, when she leaves the room, of course, it's, it's much more difficult now just to, it's like in, the, in Jackson's example, you just show a tomato and of course it, she's, she's gonna see redness. <laughs> That's gonna be something new for her. But in this case, there is no, you know, the sad object you can show and she's going to feel sad. So what kind of thing can be shown to sad Mary so that she's going to, for the first time, have the feeling of that thing that she has been studying for a while? Uh, maybe it's something like a, a work of art, something like a, a, a play uh, that may lead her to feel something that she has never felt before. So João defends that uh, art plays this role uh, in a sense of expanding uh, feelings and uh, experiences that you, you, you don't have yourself. So uh, one uh, I, comparison, that, that, that example is, is João's as well. Uh, uh, for instance, suppose you have never eaten uh, alligator's meat. And they say that, actually, I tasted that myself, and it, it does taste a lot like a mixture of fish and uh, chicken. It tastes a lot. So uh, in order to describe to you how uh, it tastes, uh, like I can just describe it this way. Since you have the phenomenal experience of the taste of fish and chicken, you can somehow expand a bit and think of alligator meat as tasting this way, right? So 
much what we do in art in many <laughs> cases is to expand the kind of a, uh, phenomenal experiences. Of course, it comes in degree, but you don't need the very experience of alligator meat to understand me talking of alligator meat. You just need some other experiences that I can compare and use as an analogy or whatever. So I think art does that. And you can feel like you are in a war or suffering the death of your son or whatever by engaging in this uh, uh, different sorts of uh, combinations of experiences you already have. And so you increase uh, the kind of, a, let's say, phenomenal knowledge you have uh, to a certain degree. So I'm saying that just to say that uh, maybe the simulation theory has more resources than just kind of uh, projecting the, the feelings and emotions that you already have. Uh, and it can come in a degree, but actually it, it can increase your uh, emotional and phenomenal knowledge. But, but that's just a comment. How do you react to that? No, I agree with everything you said, but <laughs> I, I also agree with the idea that art expands our experience in general our way of experience the world and and the, the others and life and, and so on. Um, but in, in, a, in a, at some point I said that I was talking about the simulation theory as a theory about how to ascribe psychological state to others without it leaving completely aside the problem or the question about imagination. And the cases you were bringing to me are cases in which you imagine how to construct a new experience from two other experiences that you had before and to imagine situation. And I expressly uh, didn't want to go that way because I was trying to find the way in which we understand each other's mind, which in uh, I don't think that in all cases has to do with imagination. Maybe many times imagination is involved, as many times imagination is involved in our understanding art or reading a book or seeing a movie and whatever. But I, I wanted to leave imagination aside because it's a, a further complication. <laughs> uh, so I agree with everything you said, but I think you are using uh, simulation there as a synonymous of, sim of imagination, not as uh, the the theory of simulation which allow us to attribute mental states to other um, running offline our our own decision processes which was the original idea about the simulation and all that i see no, but but uh, maybe the point is uh, in order to attribute uh, states to others uh, mental states or whatever uh, we may project the ones we have, but we can extrapolate to that. So maybe that's the role played by imagination you're talking about. But it's just because the, the power is given by this uh, simulation theory. If you add uh, imagination, maybe are much uh, bigger than uh, maybe the way I, I, I saw it pictured by in your presentation in the beginning. Yeah, but I, 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 I didn't do and the, the, the works yet but i think that if you add imagination to what i said is even bigger is even more interested interested than uh, adding simulation uh, imagination to the simulation theory the basic simulation theory so that's my point and also there is the other problem which is the first person the idea of phenomenal concept and the idea that I do agree that we have a phenomenal experience which is quite, quite difficult to describe and the art helps us to understand better our phenomenology. And probably in some metaphorical and non-propositional non ways and associating our phenomenal states with other things that are more or less similar and we combine in our imagination all that but i can explain the same with a second person without uh, committing myself to phenomenal or first person concepts <laughs> but i didn't talk about imagination if i add imagination to what i said i think i can do what you do uh, and do it without that commitment 
Uh, all right. As I said, I was playing devil's advocate. I, I think I should add uh, imagination to your theory, so you must know that. I prefer to go your way too. Uh, but anyway, I, I want to thank you very much. We have this section in a few minutes coming. Uh, thank you, Diana, very much. That was a very nice, uh, very interesting discussion uh, and presentation. Uh, so once again, thank Diana. Thank you. And thank all the audience too. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have a five minutes break. It's not even going to be five minutes, going to be a few minutes break. Uh, and we come back to start the uh, third communication roundtable shortly. All right.